So we're going to have a talk about augmented hilarity with Anne, with Anna, Lydia, and Scary. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, this isn't a talk. Sorry if you came for a talk. Uh, we are here to tell you some jokes about science and tech and nerdy things. Is that all right? Yeah. Amazing. So um, this is how tonight's going to work. Um, my name is Anna. I'm a materials scientist. I'll show you my full name just for the full branding effect. This is my full name, Anna Pajajski. Uh, if you're wondering about the spelling of that, you're exactly right, Anna is a palindrome. <laughs> Guys, welcome to the gig where palindrome is a punchline. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, <laughs> we're here to tell you some jokes about science and tech and nerdy stuff. Um, as I said, my name is Anna Pajajski. I'm a materials scientist. Okay, I've got a PhD in building power systems for hydrogen-powered cars. Can I get an ooh? Right, this is from University College London, which is the only city in the UK where everyone gets around by tube. Which basically renders my PhD about as useful as most of the consonants in my surname. <laughs> um, I, ha I have a PhD. In fact, um, I'm very, I'm very proud of this fact. And the reason that I did a PhD was the same reason that anyone ever does a PhD, which is to be able to call yourself doctor at the end of it. <laughs> um, so now, like, whenever anyone calls me up, and they're like, "Is that Miss or Mrs.?" And I'm like, "Actually, it's Doctor." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get letters through the post, and they're addressed to Miss Anna Pajajski, and I'm like, nope, return to sender. That person is dead. <laughs> they do not exist anymore. And um, it got very confusing during the World Cup, because I, I would be watching the football, and um, the commentator would be like, ah, oh, he shoots, ah, oh, he misses. I'd be like, actually, it's doctor. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Um, the reason I'm so proud of using my PhD credentials um, is that I had to sort of wade through a steaming pile of patriarchy for four years in order to be able to call myself doctor. Um, and this was mainly uh, due to one particular person who we're going to call Dickhead Dave. <laughs> okay. Uh, and um, Dickhead Dave, one of the first things that Dickhead Dave ever said to me, right, on my first day in the lab, was you're blatantly only here because of the size of your boobs. Right? Wow. Which is obviously false, because having boobs in a lab is very detrimental to doing experiments, as I would later find out, right? Because you'd be walking around, and then, like, suddenly, magnetic objects would just stick to your underwire. <laughs> like, so you'd be trying to do an experiment, and then, like, a clamp stand would be over here, <laughs> like, sticking to yourself. It's very difficult to do experiments as someone that wears a bra in a lab. Um, so he wasn't wrong on that front, but he was wrong on the front that women can't do science, okay? Um, and him and his two little cronies, right, twat-faced Tim and misogynist Mike, <laughs> they, um, they, really, they really kind of isolated me from everybody at work, right? So it got, it got so bad that I decided to re-download an old version of Microsoft Office 97, just so that I could chat to Clippy, the office assistant. <laughs> so... <laughs> Me and Clippy, we did our PhDs together uh, in our lonely little spot in the lab. But one day, I got an email from my lab supervisor, right, my industrial sponsor who, who worked elsewhere, saying, would you like to come and work with us at the NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida? Right? And so I was like, OK, reply in an email. Uh, and I said, dear professor supervisor, and then Clippy was immediately like, hey, it looks like you're writing a letter. And I was like, not now, Clippy. <laughs> we have to concentrate. Um, dear Professor Supervisor, um, I read with interest your invitation to come and work at the NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Um, I have one outstanding question, which is, how soon can you get me out of this shithole? <laughs> Yours, somewhat desperately, Anna Pajajski. P.S. Please note the spelling. Um, and <laughs> a few weeks later, I was touching down in Orlando, Florida. Now, I've never been anywhere like Orlando, Florida, okay? Um, my family holidays growing up were less Orange County, more Orange Squash. 
if you know what I mean. <laughs> Less Bahamas, more pajamas. <laughs> um, and so I was very excited to be there. And um, the people that I was going to be working with, right, there were three women. Okay, imagine that. A whole lab full of people of only one gender. Can't even imagine what that would look like. I can, it's every lab. <laughs> um, so, so there was Olivia, who was the lab tech, right? And we got along really, really well, because um, we were a similar age, and we bonded over our mutual love of the Spice Girls. Um, there was Jiju, who is uh, a research scientist, and she said nothing the entire time that I was there. I think because she was terrified of our boss, whose name was Formidable Allison. Okay. Uh, and the best way that I can describe formidable Alison is um, like the Margaret Thatcher of chemistry, <laughs> except with more Americanisms and less sex appeal. <laughs> uh, award yourself a bonus nerd point if you laughed at that joke because Margaret Thatcher is the Margaret Thatcher of chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> having studied it at university. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I, I was there for three weeks, right? And on my first day, Olivia gave me a tour. And she showed me these like beautiful spotless labs, right? Uh, which were the polar opposite of the horrible, dirty physics dungeon that I was used to back in London. Um, and, and on my tour, she, she showed me this massive coffee machine that they had, right? And I was like, oh, that's a nice coffee machine. Uh, where's the kettle? And she looked at me like completely blank face and was like, kettle. What's that like for tea? You British are just like the queen. <laughs> America is such a foreign country sometimes. <laughs> um, on my second day, I got a tour of NASA's biology labs, right? And this was this enormous room, probably like four times the size of this tent. Um, and there were these huge aluminum, sorry, aluminum, uh, chambers, and in all of these chambers, uh, you could control like everything, temperature, humidity, the color of the light. Um, and they were doing plant experiments in these chambers. And in the first one, they were shaking these plants around, like vibrating them. Um, and the guide said that they were doing this to see how big the plants would grow given the trauma of space flight. I was like, mate, if you want trauma, just go and spend five minutes in the physics dungeon. <laughs> Therapy for life. <laughs> Um, in another one of these chambers, all the lights were off, okay? But we peered in through the little window, <coughs> and I shit you not, this is a real thing that happened to me at NASA. We peered in through the window, and there was an octopus in a tank of water. And the guide slammed the door shut and said, you didn't see that. <laughs> I think I might have seen the next president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> being grown in a lab in NASA. And I think it's going to get much better from here on in. <laughs> um, life in Florida was amazing. Okay, there was incredible wildlife. I would see dolphins on my way to work. Uh, my experiments were working. What? That never happens. My experiments were working. Yes. Um, and I was even starting to, to crack formidable Allison. Or when I say crack formidable Allison, I really mean that now whenever we walked into the lab together, Instead of letting the door slam back in my face, she would actually hold it open for me like a normal person. <laughs> um, so that was all rather nice. Um, and, but as the days kind of went into weeks, those familiar feelings of loneliness that I was used to kind of started to creep back in. Because my only friend out there was Olivia, the lab tech, um, and she had her own life going on, or so she said. Maybe she realized that I wasn't actually Baby Spice after all. Um, I got so lonely that one evening I took myself off to go and watch Fifty Shades of Grey on my own at the cinema. Guys, Fifty Shades of Grey was not the documentary about steel alloys that I was expecting. <laughs> I'm scarred for life. <laughs> One weekend, I went to the NASA Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center, where they keep all their old rockets and space shuttles and stuff. And um, <laughs> there is no sadder sight, right, than a grown woman in her 20s going like this in front of a photograph of a rocket taking off while a professional photographer takes her photo on her own. <laughs> um, I also I, I bought a mug from the NASA gift shop, right? 
I took it back to my apartment and I drank shit tea out of it, which I boiled on the hob, because nowhere in America has a kettle. <laughs> um, towards the end of my stay in NASA, um, we decided to Skype with the scientists back in the UK to tell them our results. And um, during this Skype conversation, they told us that actually they'd done some more calculations and now our goalposts for our work in the US had shifted. Now, I had to translate this for formidable Alison and tell her that the hoops had moved or however the fuck basketball works. <laughs> no idea. Uh, but all too soon, I was back on the flight to London and I was back in the lab on the Monday morning. Now, I've had to stop calling it the Dungeon Lab because Fifty Shades has given me some very confusing feelings about dungeons. <laughs> but here was I, right? I might have been a woman in science, but I was a woman in science that had just worked at NASA. So I was feeling kind of confident, like, I don't have to be bullied by you guys anymore, dickhead Dave et al. Um, <laughs> science joke for you guys. <laughs> That went really well. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I was feeling all, all good about myself. Um, Dickhead Dave smashed my NASA mug as soon as I got back and bullied me for the next four years until I got my PhD and left. But I did get it, which is the main thing. Um, so <laughs> how long have I been going on for? Right, um, I'm going to introduce to you our next act. Um, they are a incredible physicist and incredible performer of all sorts of different ways of communicating physics, which is the hardest one to communicate, I reckon. Um, so please give them an extremely warm welcome. Please welcome to the stage at Scary Boots. Hello. Hello. Is this thing on? Good, good. Uh, yes, my name is Scary. Yes, that's an adjective. Yes, like Scary Spice. Yes, like Scary Movie. Yes, we all lived through the 90s, apart from those of us who didn't. Hello. Um, uh, so yeah, don't, don't get worked up about having a weird name. It's okay, just call me that. Um, so today I thought I would ruin romance for you um, through the medium of science and technology. Uh, so what is more romantic than a diamond? Diamonds, symbols of love. Diamonds, because they're so scarce and rare, like proper, proper interaction and connection with a human being. Um, but you can make your own diamonds in a way you cannot make your own love, uh, with explosions. So uh, this, this is how the Soviets uh, made diamonds. You can make nanodiamonds, which uh, I'm currently paid to study nanoscience, so I'm contractually obliged to say that that is the best kind of diamond. Um, you can make them with a load of TNT, and as the blast front pushes out, it crushes the carbon uh, that's in the environment between the blast front and the air, and you get five nanometer nanodiamonds, which is cool. Um, but, you know, whatever Mythbusters may have taught us, maybe explosions aren't always the solution. Maybe not every relationship should start with a bang. Maybe some relationships should be allowed to grow. Because you can grow diamonds in a lab, right? You've just got to get carbon and put it under the right temperature and pressure. Uh, you can get carbon from anywhere, you know, like soot, barbecues, dead pets. And, uh, and if you keep that at the right temperature and pressure, you can grow a diamond. And that's a bit of a problem if you're a diamond company, because somehow, suddenly, people can make the thing that you sell really cheaply. So they're trying to convince us that only mine diamonds really, truly express love because there's nothing like being kept underground at high pressure for millions of years and then dug up and polished so you can be a better status symbol. That's, there's nothing like that that represents a relationship. Um, actually, my relationship is uh, much more like lab-grown diamonds in that I constantly monitor it um, and make graphs. But <laughs> that's my partner over there. Um, he likes the graphs too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, but uh, where was I going with this? Yes, we constantly monitor it and make graphs. So, um, yes, but diamonds, they are also hard and they endure. Also, we want that in a relationship, don't we? But diamonds can be shattered with hammers. They can be burnt with blow torches. You can burn diamonds if you just get enough oxygen to that diamond. Antoine Lavoisier in the 1700s managed to burn diamonds with just a magnifying glass, the power of the sun, and a tank of liquid oxygen. So if you've got a wedding ring you don't want anymore or a relationship that you'd like to take out back and shoot in the head, that's your next weekend's project. Um, I don't know, diamonds, uh, they also have a reputation uh, for being forever. Um, but actually, 
like I said, it's just carbon atoms. And carbon, like everything else in the universe, is bloody lazy. And if you leave carbon long enough, it will form the least energetic phase it can, which is graphite, what you get in pencil leads. So your token of eternal love, that you'll forever love them, give it a couple of million years, so that'll just be a big pencil lead on your finger. Um, and forever is a shorter time than it used to be, I'm just saying. Um, according to Marilyn Monroe, diamonds are friendly. And I, I would contest this. Um, I mean, in some places, diamonds are used to fuel war and uh, pay child soldiers, which I guess lets those children get out and meet new people. So, like, maybe a bit friendly. And uh, diamonds are transparent in infrared, so you can see your friends' heat signatures through them and be like, hey. And uh, that's why they use them on the noses of heat-seeking missiles. So as they come bouncing over to you, like over-enthusiastic explosive metal puppies, to say hello, the last thing you see is a diamond. So I guess it's kind of friendly. Yeah, I'll give it a half score. Um, but yeah, overall, I think diamonds are not the romantic implements they have been made out to be. But you're all geeks. You're thinking, huh, I never fell for that consumerist, conformist rubbish anyway. I believe in proper romance. I believe in intimate personal relationships. So I'm going to ruin that too. Um, <laughs> Because I want to tell you a story about a really cute story that's been going around since it was first told on Radio Lab about, um, do we know the Voyager probes? I know you do. Like, I mean, if you've seen, his, if you've seen what he looks like, that's funny. If not, check him out later. Um, so, uh, not like that. Oh, God. Sorry, Adam. <laughs> Um, so, Voyager probes, furthest things, from human, uh, furthest things from Earth. Voyager 1 is currently 13.3 billion miles away from the sun. It's beyond the influence of the solar system now. It's going out into space. And on that, we placed a mixtape, um, because NASA in the 70s. Um, and we made a, a gold record, um, gold so it doesn't tarnish in space. Uh, it's not that we just wanted to flash the cash. Um, and and we, we got Carl Sagan to work on making this mixtape. Do we know Carl Sagan? Okay, good, because otherwise this story was going to be a bit weird, not going to lie. Um, so uh, Carl Sagan uh, was the director on this project, and there was also a woman called Anne Druyan, who was the creative director. And they were working to put together, um, with some other people, a disc that would represent the entirety of life on Earth. And um, it looked like this. And they were putting together sounds and pictures, you know, languages of Earth from ancient Akkadian to English. And, uh, you know, the sentiment of a mother's kiss and all sorts of things. Um, and this is an example of some of the content that they put on. Um, I don't really know what this picture is supposed to represent. I think on the left, it's a woman hybridizing with an ice cream. Uh, on the middle, it's a man exploring toroidal geometry with his teeth. And on the right-hand side, it's someone who's learned to drink exclusively through IKEA instruction books. <laughs> um, so I don't know what the world is going to make of that when they find it. So we put this sort of thing on, and Anne and Carl, they're trying to find the last piece of music that they need to go on this disc and represent Earth, represent us to anybody who's listening. And they're looking for a piece of Chinese music, and Anne finds it. She finds the perfect thing. And she calls Carl and says something like, Hi, Carl, I found the perfect thing. And leaves a message on a voicemail. And then Carl calls her back. And Anne, she doesn't, she doesn't tell us what happened during that conversation, because she's got a right to privacy. Um, but in that 90 minutes, they start off as colleagues, and they end up engaged. And they fell in love while making a mixtape for the universe. And people say, this is so, oh, people say, oh, this is so romantic. Bloody stupid is what it is. <laughs> it's inadequately researched. I took longer choosing my vacuum cleaner than that. <laughs> Did they even read the reviews? Did they check if their ports were compatible? Call themselves researchers? I, I am shocked. But um, that's, not, that's not the worst thing about this. Um, uh, the worst thing about this, uh, did she even know if his breath smelled? That would be an issue, right? If you've gotten engaged to someone before you've even like kissed them. Um, but that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is he's already married at this point. He's got a seven-year-old son. And, you know, I'm not old-fashioned enough to think that marriages should only be between two people, but I do think that you should tell other people before you invite them into the marriage and get everybody's agreement on that. Marriages are like showers. You should know everyone who's in one with you, otherwise it gets creepy. <laughs> but that's not, that's not even the worst bit, right? So, um, 
uh, they record the brainwaves of this woman the next day. And she's thinking about the fact that she's met the man she's going to fall in love with, she's going to marry him, even though he's already married. Um, and these brainwaves get recorded and sent into space. So we've sent into space this picture and a woman going, yeah, sure, man, 90 minutes of talk, that's fine. That seems like a basis to like, correct my life based on. So what message are the aliens going to take from this? They're going to be like, these humans, they have this wonderful art, this wonderful culture, and 90 minutes of sweet talk, and they're anybody's. They're going to come on over, and we're going to be screwed. Um, but that's not, that's not the best bit about this. Um, because the wife he already had, you know, the one who was living at home and looking after their son while he was working on this wonderful project, um, he actually met her while working on the first project we made to send out culturally uh, neutral values to represent Earth to aliens. So that's uh, this one, the pioneer plaque. And uh, his, his wife at the time, Linda, she was the one who drew this picture with him. So I think we have to ask, was working on discs to communicate the, the essence of humanity to aliens, was that Carl Sagan's kink? <laughs> is that, is, I don't know, is that a recognized fetish? Mmm, baby, talk culturally neutral to me. Mm. Can you say that in binary? Um, so uh, Linda, Linda, uh, the, uh, his artist wife, um, she drew the picture on the right-hand side. And uh, you'll notice there's a few weird things about this picture. Um, one, uh, the woman's sort of kind of Barbie style. Um, now, labia come in all shapes and sizes, but there's no labia on Earth that you can't see the cleft between them. And uh, that's because it was censored. It's not, it's not Linda's choice. So we sent a drawing of ourselves naked, but we didn't want to show the lady parts because that would be too much. Um, you'll also note that there's no hair on any of these bodies because um, aliens are really upset by body hair. Um, you, know, you know the greys? You see the pictures of the grey aliens with the big heads and the big eyes. They've not got any hair, not because that's how they, uh, that's how they exist. It's just that they do a lot of waxing. So we didn't want to upset them. Um, but the other thing that we included is this kind of uh, star-shaped thing on the left, which is a map of where Earth is um, with, in relation to stars that give out pulses, which we call pulsars, because astronomers believe in very literal naming. And uh, this says basically the frequency at which they pulse and how far away they are. And uh, this is a map that we thought in 1970 would be a really good way of directing people to, you know, come on over. Um, but uh, we've since discovered this is a map of 13, 14 pulsars. Um, we thought they were quite rare, but actually it turns out there's a billion of them in the galaxy. Um, and quite a lot of them have the same frequency. So uh, we've actually just said, come on over. We live kind of near here. Um, and one of them, we actually got the location wrong. Um, so this is kind of equivalent to being like, hey, I live on Earth, come find me. From my window, I can see three trees. <laughs> One is 15-ish meters tall. Um, so I think we need to... Uh, so this we blasted off into space. Linda, Linda blasted off... Uh, sorry, confused. Um, Carl Sagan's first wife was also on the project which featured the brain waves of the woman he just left her for thinking about how happy she was to have hooked up with Carl. And this woman, she must have been a champion because she just sent it off into space. And I think she probably enjoyed seeing that record blasted off into space. Um, I think it's a tribute to her that she didn't blast it into the sun, frankly. Um, but we sent it off, so we sent off something that got our address wrong, drew our genitals wrong, and featured us going, hey man, we're up for it. So I think aliens are going to come over here. They're going to be quite exasperated um, by the time they get here because they'll have had to check a billion stars on the way. And they're going to get here and they'll, you know, there's a lot of signals being beamed around the planet and uh, helpfully quite a lot of these feature naked ladies. So it'll be really easy for people to, you know, compare and contrast the diagram. And they'll see that and they'll get here and they'll be like, bloody species. They can't even figure out where they live or what their genitals look like. <laughs> I cannot be bothered. I'm going home. Uh, so, yeah, don't bother with diamonds. Don't bother with the weird quirk of making uh, space discs with your lovely. Um, maybe, maybe seek solace in friendship. <laughs> I've just destroyed romance. I'm scary. Next act is up. <laughs> scary boots! <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I'm going to introduce to you our next act straight away. Is that all right? 
start the applause. Uh, my name is, is Lydia Nicholas, and, and I'm an anthropologist. For me, it started very young. Uh, I grew up in an area with a lot of different cultures. Uh, there were lots of different perspectives on the same kinds of problems, and I saw that, that with these different worldviews, you could come to a different sort of, uh, sort of understanding and different kinds of solutions. Uh, from that soft stuff, I, I, I got into Vikings at a very young age. Tragic, really. And I moved, I moved from the easy things, the myths, the legends, into the legal systems and the way that they organize land and farming, because I was a really entertaining 12-year-old. Um, from, from that, that kind of taught me exactly how different kind of social and legal and, and complicated structures within a society can lead to things like the Vikings uh, having a lot of spare uh, sons. They, they, liked big families and they didn't give them any land uh, to head off on violent holiday. Um, and since the past, as we all know, is a gateway drug to the future, uh, that got me into science fiction, thinking about how new worlds uh, could be constructed, how we could live together in different ways. Uh, that then wasn't weird enough because uh, it, it just resembled rich people uh, a lot of the time. So I, I got into studying into studying present cultures or, or anthropology. That's the thing. Anthropology, uh, for those that don't know, is the study of humans, is human polity, not the study of ants. They teach you that in the first lesson at anthropology school. There are less people at the second lesson. Uh, so why, why would an anthropologist, a human pologist, study technology? Um, well, first of all, you don't fund the social sciences, so there's that. You've got to do what you what you got to do. Um, but also, I don't know if you guys have noticed, uh, but humans make technology. Uh, humans build technology. Humans, if you're lucky, uh, buy technology, and uh, humans use technology, often badly uh, or weirdly, really. Um, so, uh, like, f uh, for instance, uh, you don't necessarily think about technology being all about people, but then in the 90s we thought that hacking was about putting sunglasses on while you were already inside, looking at green numbers scrolling through a, uh, a screen and having fingers come out of your fingers, come out more fingers, and then typing, I'm in. Uh, whereas, in fact, it turns out that the best way to hack into a bank account is to call up a bank and be really polite and pretend that you forgot your password, uh, that you were someone else. Um, the, uh, the other thing that might, it might seem that humans use technology weirdly. For instance, we created this incredible network of knowledge uh, of, of the internet. We created ways to share information all around the world uh, through cables under the ocean and, and through satellites storing through the sky. Uh, and then we use that, it seems mostly, to send pictures of cats. Um, pictures of cats, uh, celebrity cats, cosplaying as your favorite celebrity cats, um, memes about cats, uh, basically mountains of perfect communications. Like the internet also loves puns, so you can just Google those. Like I did not write those puns. Uh, I'm furry sorry. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Uh, so, but, but for an, an anthropologist of technology who studies how people use information and systems, that's not a surprise, because when we look at cuneiform tablets, the oldest form of writing, uh, we find little paw prints, little toe beans, all amongst the, the, the scratches in the clay. Uh, when we look at immune, illuminated, I can do this, illuminated manuscripts, uh, beautiful things that took people months, years of their lives to create. Uh, there are often paw prints very, and very annoyed notes from monks. Um, sometimes uh, cat pee stains and really annoyed notes from monks. Um, but we know that in their heart of hearts, the monks love their cats because they have lots of little doodles in amongst the, the illuminated enormous letters of their Bibles uh, of cats. Oddly enough, more of the cats licking their bum holes than we do these days. Like in this age of prudishness, apparently, we have missed out on that. Uh, so you know, go the medievalists. Um, so, like for for thinking about how people imagine or understand technology, how they really connect, is super useful for those of us that are trying to de design things or work in a team to, to produce these things. But it's also useful when you try and understand the politics uh, that 
create the, the spaces within which we imagine and build futures. Uh, for instance, for a lot of people, maybe this is less relevant here, but for a lot of people, when I ask them what futuristic means to them, they imagine a shiny rocket in space. They imagine some kind of cylindrical, shiny silver rocket heading off somewhere. Um, I go to a lot of events about the future. I talk a lot about AI. Um, and, and that means that I end up seeing a lot of things that are supposedly about futuristic stuff, which show me things that seem to be from the 50s, right? So that shiny rocket in space, that was the future in the 18th century when people looked at trains going that way and went, what if that, but up? Uh, it was the future in the 18th century with H.G. Wells and the, the War of the Worlds. It was the future in the 50s in the space race. And then weirdly, it was still the future in the 60s and 70s after we'd been to the moon and we had had rockets do successful things. And, and part of the reason of that is that these stories we tell about the future, these technologies that we describe and that we, we discuss and build are not necessarily about the technology themselves. They're often about seizing the imaginative space, about building the world that we imagine that we want. And so in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, a lot of that was about the Cold War. So you'd have these shiny rockets zooming off into space uh, alongside games or magazines that were marketed, often at small boys, because this was about the military, uh, so playing target practice. At the same time, girls were generally expected to think about the past. Princesses, traditional gender roles. Uh, so they would have these shiny rockets, boys playing target practice, that's still marketed to us as a future. And I'll be honest, to me that doesn't sound great. That sounds like a urinal. That is a urinal future, and I don't necessarily want that. Um, so, so I want a future that is weird and diverse and strange, that comes from all sorts of different places. Uh, but that's quite hard to achieve these days. It's hard to think your way out of the patterns that have been instilled in you. Uh, there's a William Gibson quote, which you'll all know, uh, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Now Gibson, as many men have emailed me after I've spoken about him to ex uh, have explained to me, uh, like he actually came at this with quite a sophisticated viewpoint and I know that, I just have a limited time. Um, but yes, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. What a lot of people take that to mean, what I've seen that used to say is, I got the futures and if you can afford them, you might get some too. Like your futures, they come out of places like Silicon Valley, out of uh, Silicon Roundabout, no they don't. Um, they, co they come out of those places and they're supposed to be rolled out to all sorts of other places that somehow are behind them in time, even though linear time moves forward everywhere. Uh, even in uh, like Dulwich, I've told, I'm told. Um, so, we hear that the future isn't distributed yet, but actually the future, <laughs> the future isn't the preserve of a certain kind of hoodie-wearing hacker. Um, the kind of places, uh, like for instance, if you think that, that like the UK or the US is where the future happens, go to Singapore, the Wi-Fi works. Like it just works everywhere. It works better than it does here. It's amazing. Like, and, and even in countries that you think of as, that, that have really struggled for very complicated political reasons, like, I, I mean, the, the Wi-Fi signal that is, is better in most of Cambodia than it is in most of London. Um, and and that's, that's kind of because people jump forward in, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, the, like one of the great examples that I love is that the place where a lot of the Bitcoin transactions are happening uh, is not actually in, again, hoodie wearing hacker camps, uh, but in Zimbabwe, because they ran out of physical currency quite a while ago. Uh, so they decided to have a Bitcoin ATM. And for a while, that was the only place in the country that you could get money from a cash point. Uh, there are actually more Bitcoin transactions going on sometimes in a Zimbabwean countryside market uh, than there are in the big cities that you think of being the center of this of these kind of activity. Uh, so your average Bitcoin user is a bit less like a kind of, uh, person with excitingly colored hair and a really stylish leather jacket uh, at a hacker camp. And more, it's, it's, a, like, it's an African mother uh, trying to haggle over yams. And that is, those people are literally living in the future that a lot of people here might be looking towards. Um, I see a lot of, I, I end up, as I say, going to a lot of these futures events. Uh, 
And some of them, the, the smallness of people's imagination uh, is kind of shown off. So I was once standing uh, at a stand in an event in, in Brussels and the, I was trying to get a trying to get a snack really um they were giving away nachos and i i like food um as i'll come back to but it someone came over to me and said like oh you're, you're sitting down on our eating our food could you wear this vr headset and witness the future of insurance i mean i already had nachos in my mouth so i could not say no the VR headset goes on. I, I, I sit down in a very fancy chair because insurance salesmen can afford fancy chairs. It makes them feel their life is worth something. Um, so I put that on, and uh, and uh, like immediately I'm transported to the magical world of an office. In fact, it's a meeting room. Now I've said I like food. I love food. I'm allergic. I can't eat wheat. Um, as uh, and so I sit down, and in front of me on this virtual table. They've given me virtual biscuits. Now the thing is, to me, I can't eat wheat. So to me, most biscuits are virtual biscuits. <laughs> like they're always just decoration. I'm happy for you guys, but you know. And but in front of me, there were virtual biscuits. And a guy, a guy like, in a suit, walks into this virtual meeting room and says, "I'm going to show you the future." <laughs> oh, great! Um, it immediately cuts, and I and I am taken to a vista of a man doing, like, zooming between lots of different screens, explaining to someone how they can get their Tesla, uh, like their Tesla has sent them lots of information, which means that they can get this particular kind of insurance claim and they're sending a taxi right now. Um, and this took like five minutes. It was really uh, complicated to see, like, this is just, why don't they just have an AI there? Then you don't have to create this entire interface. Like, this is terrible. It cuts. And the guy literally, like, a guy in a virtual meeting room hands me a plate. It's like, would you like a virtual biscuit? I can't take the biscuit. I have a headset on. Uh, eventually that cuts. I come back to, I come back to the, um, I come back to the future session. I, I stumble away, uh, hurt and exhausted and hungry again because <laughs> biscuits. Uh, unfortunately, as I say, I can't eat wheat. They don't usually end up, like, bothering to put much on. It's just donuts in the shape of, symbols that I don't understand, but I'm sure that you can put them together to program something, like a badge. Um, like, write Python in donuts, then I'll be impressed. Um, and and like, so I, I end up going off to the, um, the future food stall, where I can get my regular supply of insects. Now, this is one of the strange things, like at futures events, they always want to serve you insects because that's apparently the future of food, but they've sort of forgotten how food works. Like, if you're serving someone chicken, like future chicken, you wouldn't just give them a, like, a still feathered, warm, unseasoned animal and say, like, eat. But that is what they do when they're trying to, when they're trying to serve people bis uh, insects. So I, I sit down uh, and I, I'm, I'm served a plate, which is literally a pile of grasshoppers. There isn't even salt. And they say, well, you know, do you dare eat them? And I'm like, yes, I do. I can't eat donuts. I'm going to eat the freaking insects. And I'm like, ah, most people don't dare. Like, this, this doesn't tell me that insects are not an amazing and new rich source of protein. This just tells me that a lot of the time white people don't season food right. <laughs> and, and that, along with a lot of the other sorts of like the, the work of trying to imagine how a better future could exist uh, has taught me very much that the, the only things, uh, one, make more donuts that I can eat. And two, don't trust anyone uh, who tells you how the future should be if all of them on stage look exactly like me. Because uh, we can't even be trusted to season food. Thanks. Lydia Nicholas! Thanks, Lydia. People, we have come to the end of Augmented Hilarity. Oh, thank you all so much for coming. Um, if you've enjoyed it, give us a hashtag on Twitter. We'll say hi back. Um, if you want us to come to your next tech fest or conference, um, get in touch with us on Twitter. We would absolutely love that. So that's it.
Thank you for coming to Augmented Hilarity. We've been Anna, Scary and Lydia. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your festival.